Hello and welcome to the third game of this new video series on the domination of the opponent species. So today we're going to have a look at a game between the Ukrainian Grandmaster Yuri Stolodovnyshenko with a strong Grandmaster rated around 2600. He was playing against Igor Natav who is a famous French Grandmaster. He was the French captain of the national team in 2019. He's been the second of uh, Radyabov for many years and actually I believe he still is. Actually they are still good friends. I'm sure about that. Do they still work together? I don't know but I think so. Anyway, Natav is extremely well prepared in the opening and one of his big specialties is the Zveshnikov Sicilian, that's to say the 4, knight f6 and e5, that's the Zveshnikov Sicilian and well trust me Igor knows it so well that you don't really want to meet him in that opening so that explains why Solodovnyshenko decided to go for bishop b5. White black play d6, which is one of the most popular move against uh, the Rosolimo. So bishop b5 is a Rosolimo. Well, e6 is obviously not the only move. You can also play g6, d6, knight f6. There are many moves, but uh, generally speaking, Zvechnikov players like to play e6 for some reason. Bishop c6, so that's uh, not a forced move. You may also castle knight g7, and then the, there's uh, there are a lot of theory as well, but bishop c6 is a critical move, obviously weaknessing, weaknessing the bone structure of uh, of black, uh, but on the other hand sacrificing the bishop pair. White played d3, so black is having problems where to develop this knight, since as a knight f6 there would always be e5, so generally black puts a knight on uh, the knight on g6 in such uh, variations. And white goes h4 to try to punish that uh, miss sort of um, strange placement of the knight on, on g6. Of course black does not want to allow h5 so he plays h5 himself. And white goes e5 in order to paralyze black a little bit on the dark squares and not to allow black to play e5 himself and then get a fantastic position with a bishop pair and a perfect coordination. So e5, f6 is a typical reaction. So black would first need to develop, but on the on let's say on the middle term, it would be quite a good objective to exchange these pawns and then get a very strong center. Queen e4 was played, so inviting black to play f5 and then the queen would just have to go back, but then the pawn on e5 would stay forever. This is not what black wants, so black just played king f7 to protect the knight on f7. Obviously that's against the principles that we teach to beginners uh, or to any chess player that uh, you should uh, put your king on f7 so early. But in that kind of position, this is one of these exceptions uh, when the, knight, the, the, the king is actually not so bad on f7. Actually I've played, that, I've played similar positions with black. I even remember playing, playing one game against Michael Adams and I got a very good position putting my king on f7 in a very similar situation and the same opening. Um, so king f7, very typical move, it cannot be checked with, well it can be checked with a knight but that's going to cost white a piece. So king f7 is a good move here. Knight bd2, many moves here for black but black decided to play d5 and to sort of, uh, well, sacrifice his pawn structure meaning that uh, well he has isolated double pawns we could sort of consider this is half a pawn less for black but on the other hand he is very active he has a bishop pair and he's hoping that's going to compensate for it knight b3 was played in order to target the c5 pawn with bishop e3 so knight c4 looked much more natural but on the other hand after queen d5 what is the knight exactly doing on c4, it looks nice, but uh, that's basically it. So knight b3 is a logical one. Bishop e3. And here I think Natav made a mistake. He took on e4, and actually that's, well, first of all, I think that's against the spirit of the position, um, since black should just uh, try to play as active as possible. and. 
also simply a mistake because he ends up in a slightly worse endgame probably. I think a5 for example would have been a great move. In case of queen d5 and knight e5 then there would be tremendous compensation here for the pawn with such a beautiful center and a bishop pair. And knight a c5 first would probably be even worse because black would have an intermediary check here. And after c3 then that would be uh, a fantastic position for black not who hasn't even lost the pawn to get this uh, this uh, fantastic endgame. So queen takes c4 was played anyway. D takes c4, c4. But now black has to, is having to defend this pawn with bishop a6. That's well, that's uh, not something that uh, that you like to do to just put your bishop on a6 to defend the pawn on c4. It's a little bit uh, well, it's a little bit passive, let's say. Um, probably in a tough south is going to have enough counterplay with rook b8, but what happened is that white was clever enough to put his king on c2 and protect the b2 pawn, and then it was difficult to find counterplay for black. He played bishop b5, a5, check at some point, king c1, of course, not playing b3, allowing black to undouble his, uh, his c pawns. Bishop c6, so inviting white to take on c4, but then bishop e4 would be coming. And here white played a very strange move, in my opinion. He played bishop f4, which I can very hardly understand, because I don't really know what he wanted to do in case of uh, e5, simply. So probably, well, I don't know, maybe he, was a f maybe he wanted to... Maybe actually he wanted to remaneuver his knight and he was afraid of knight e5, so he was hoping for e5, bishop e3, and then remaneuver his knight or something like that. Although I don't know how to remaneuver it exactly. Uh, but anyway, he played bishop f4, um, tempting black to do two things. One is e5, which I think was alright, and the other one to take on f4 and simply. Uh, get the bishop pair, I mean, get the second bishop and damage the white pawn structure. I believe that black should be fine now. But here black made a mistake. He sacrificed the c4 pawn and played rook g6. He was probably expecting white to play knight e5 check and actually win a second pawn. And after rook g4, then there would be fair chances to, to make a draw with black. Since he's recovering one pawn, and uh, the white pawn is the white pawns are a little bit weak, and black is quite active, so this is probably what black was expecting. Although still, I don't understand why he wanted to enter all that. But the good thing is, it gave us a fantastic example on domination of the opponent's pieces. Since here, white did not play knight e5 check to go for a second pawn. He played knight g5 check, sacrificing a full knight, well, a full knight for a pawn, and just to trap the rook on g6. And that becomes, the rook on g6 here becomes the dominated piece in that game, and this is why that game made it to the topic we're studying right now. So knight e5 check now is a very big stretch since it would uh, collect a full rook, so... One very important thing here is that bishop g5 check and rook g5 is not possible because of f4. Attacking the rook and then knight e5 check is coming, winning a full piece. You can't even go rook h5 or something. Keep the rook on the fifth rank to sacrifice an exchange only on e5 because there is no square for the rook. So you're just losing a full piece here. That means that black has to play passive. And actually after f4 here, White is uh, White has sacrificed the piece, but actually is playing with an extra rook because that rook on g8 is never going to escape. Black played bishop d6, but White does not mind exchanges. So as in previous games, White is ready to exchange all the pieces uh, except the rook on g6. He just wants um, Black to remain with that rook on g6. I mean, even opponent games, uh, even I mean, even uh, even let's say uh, rock. Well, not we can't call it uh, Poland games because there would be 
they would still be rock there, but let's say positions with rock versus rock and bishop could be totally winning if the rock just stays there on g6 and we push the pawns on the queen side. So black tried to seek for counterplay, bishop c6, now he's recover is well he's winning another pawn, he's recovering another pawn, so it's only one pawn for the piece. But actually the rock on g6 is still there. It would have been possible to, for white to go maybe rock d8 check and try to start collecting some pawns, but white has to be careful about rock g5 and h4, h3 and so on. So actually white played it very clever, playing rock f1, trapping the king here. King h7, so black is hoping to take and play king g6. But white is coming back just in time with his king. And obviously with the king on his read, the black pawns are not being are not going to be very straightening. Bishop d5, a funny move, just inviting white to take a free piece, uh, which white does not want because he wants a rock to stay on g6. Does not want to allow e takes d5, freeing the g6 rock. So um, b3 was played, bishop g2, rock g2, and out of desperation, black sacrificed the rock here, but obviously he was too far enough to get any counterplay and resigned. What would have happened in case of uh, bishop c6, let's say, instead of rock takes g5, is that white would probably go rook f8, blocking completely um, the king on h7, where it's not necessary you can also go rock king is free of course but for example something like that and then well maybe even king f4 next and then start collecting all the pots and we're going to well we're going to make probably we're going to make three queens out of this uh three queen side pawns with uh white so quite an instructive game and a very nice move by white knight g5 check and that dominated rook on g6. I hope you did enjoy that third game and see you very soon for the fourth and last one.